We welcome you all to our workshop. It is my pleasure and honor to be presenting with my esteemed colleagues. I also want to take one moment to acknowledge all of our sponsors and everyone involved in putting the symposium together. It's been fantastic, including the State of New Mexico, Human Service Division, UNM, and everyone involved in that, as, along with my colleagues. We welcome you to our workshop where we're going to be discussing the needs of Latinx and Hispanics in New Mexico, specifically regarding expanding our bilingual supervisors and supervisees in culturally and linguistically responsive programs. Next. These are brief um, disclosure of our um, disclosure statements here. Next. It is my honor to present to you Sylvia Costa, PhD, pronouns she, her, hers. She's an associate professor at the University of New Mexico Center for Development and Disability. She is bilingual, English and Spanish licensed psychologist. She specializes in the evaluation and treatment of autism spectrum disorder. She is also the director of psychology training at the Center for Development and Disability, where she provides clinical supervision of fellows and interns. She's provided bilingual community trainings, clinical services, and clinical supervision to trainees working, culturally and working with culturally and linguistically diverse clients across the state of New Mexico. Dr. Acosta received her doctoral degree in counseling psychology at Colorado State University, where she specialized in child assessment and intervention. She completed her internship and postdoctoral training at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, University of Southern California. She was raised in southern New Mexico and has lived in Albuquerque for the last 10 years. I'm also pleased to present my colleague Karen Godinez Gonzalez, who is a third year counseling psychology doctoral student at New Mexico State University. She graduated from the University of California, Irvine with a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and Psychology. She also received a Master of Science in Counseling Psychology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison before arriving at New Mexico State University. And as a Master's in Doctoral Level Training Clinicians, she's provided Spanish-English bilingual psychological services in Wisconsin, Texas, and New Mexico. And given her experiences as a bilingual trainee and supervisee, her dissertation research, which her proposal was just approved on Monday, congratulations, focuses on the experience of Latinx bilingual supervisees and their experience in supervision. And finally, I'm Marie Weil, a bilingual licensed clinical psychologist, board certified in clinical health psychology. I'm president of my specialty clinical health practice here in Silver City, New Mexico, where I also graduated from high school 30 years ago. I perform bilingual culturally competent psychological testing and assessment. I consult and provide clinical supervision. And my work experience spans interprofessional collaboration across the Veterans Health Administration, Federal Bureau of Prisons, hospitals, universities, managed care, private practice, community behavioral health and a federally qualified health center. I studied and obtained my doctoral and master's in clinical psychology from Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, another master's degree in applied psych from Penn State University, and my bachelor's degrees in psychology and Spanish from Sweetbriar College. I'm active in multiple national associations, the state psychological association and division. I collaborate with my colleagues that you've heard in our prior presentations across the state, and I was one author of the New Mexico Clinical Supervision Implementation Guide. And if you haven't seen that, I do encourage you to um, access it. And if you're a psychologist, you can also presently access it through the New Mexico Psychological Association for CE credit. I'm certainly committed to equity, diversity, and inclusivity. Next slide. We hope today that you will be able to really identify why it's important that we're discussing bilingual Spanish-English supervision. We hope that you'll be able to discuss the a couple of delivery and training program models here in New Mexico and describe three to four different um, practices, bilingual training and professional development practices for diversity, inclusion, and equity. We also hope that you gain um, learning 
and able to identify critical experiences specifically of bilingual trainees or your supervisees and their bilingual supervisors relationship dyads. We're going to provide you with several resources for development of your Spanish clinical skills and listing three three strategies at least for working ethically with um, interpreters who are interpreting in Spanish. And as with all of our workshops that we've done during this month long sim summit, we hope that you will register and become involved in a supervision network in New Mexico. And in particular, if you're involved in offering bilingual Spanish English clinical services or clinical supervision in, in New Mexico, that you will register for that as well. Next slide. We want to start off by gathering some information about our participants today, and Jen will be putting up our poll questions. Please take just a few moments to respond yes or no to the two questions in front of you. So it keeps changing on me. Um, so we're asking you, you personally, if you actually provide services. So you, about 40% uh, of you provide services in Spanish, another 58% do not. Um, for some of you, it's not applicable, and that's just fine. We welcome you and hope you will gain um, out of this workshop. We're providing lots of information for um, diverse audience. And for those of you that indicated you are providing supervision, um, in terms of supervision in Spanish, the majority of you do not, while about 15% of you do. Thank you. Next slide. So I've already spoken about all three of us. What we plan to do is just give you a little bit more personal information about ourselves in terms of our background. I do identify as a white female psychologist. I'm a non-heritage Spanish speaker. I have been speaking Spanish and living in bilingual bicultural communities all my life. Specifically, growing up in being born in California, growing up on two sides of um, the border in Nogales, Arizona, Nogales, Sonora, Mexico is where I learned Spanish and lived um, in two worlds. And then, of course, here in New Mexico. My lived experiences um, promoted my interest and passion, obviously. And even though I identify as I do, I always tell people my heart is Latina. Um, and that's because of the important influence um, being raised here in Southwest United States and in Arizona and New Mexico. As a, as a um, student, I pursued the blending of two passions, psychology and Spanish not only language, but also culture and literature. My, my, my interests, my lived experience also promoted me to pursue additional kinds of trainings because we know there's a dearth of, of training. Specifically, it is growing as far as offerings in Spanish clinical skills as well as um, language and culture. So I did pursue some additional trainings as a bilingual mental health provider at Our Lady of the Lake University for um, assessment and clinical supervision in Spanish. And then I also, one of the other things that I did is I am a certified uh, medical and mental health interpreter. My working and living and studying on the East Coast, I specifically sought out work experiences as well as what you would call practicum or training experiences in organizations that offered supervisors uh, that provided me with that supervision in Spanish, but also were committed to providing uh, bilingual bicultural services to the community. That certainly helped me tremendously. I certainly have lived and worked in many areas in North America, the Caribbean, traveled in South and Central America, and of course I have my lived experience in an interracial marriage. I would say about 10 years of my professional life, I've specifically worked in um, institutions that are prim primarily serving the Latino community. So my work was all in Spanish, and then my documentation was in English. In terms of my research and training, I sought out, again, additional experiences and provided and 
and did some qualitative research where I learned from my community in terms of learning, gaining their uh, stories and lived experiences about Hispanic ethnic identity and acculturation. Of course, for my doctoral degree, what I ended up doing because of the dearth of of availability of bilingual clinical supervision, I ended up developing a training program for psychologists who supervise trainees in that area. Next slide. Next, thank you. There we go, perfect. I hope some of you may find this slide familiar. I want to thank and give credit to the Interaction Institute for Social Change and their artists who has, um, updated it over time, but in particular, I also want to thank Mika Terry for um, alerting me and showing me this because I've utilized it tremendously. So in this slide, I'm talking about promoting bilingual behavioral health, equity, diversity, and inclusivity. Health disparities, as we know, are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optima, optimal health. That certainly includes behavioral health. And health disparities are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. We know that these health disparities result from poverty, environmental threats, rural geography, which we have a lot of here in New Mexico, inadequate access to healthcare, individual behavioral factors, and educational inequalities. The figure on the left looks at what is equality. And equality, igualdad in Spanish, relates to the state of everyone being treated fairly without attention to each person's varying needs. So we have three individuals looking over to watch a wonderful ball ball game and we provide them all with the same opportunity, the same size of the crate. And even though we do that, the shortest individual there still is not able to see over um, and view the ball game. Where the figure on the right depicts equity or equidad in Spanish and it specifically relates to the fair treatment and equal allocation of resources and power that are distributed across race, gender, class, sexual orientation, gender expression, and other dimensions of identity, such as age, disability status, socioeconomic status, and geographic location. So when we actually provide the shortest individual with two crates, everyone now is able to um, see over and see the, see the nice ball game going on. So inequity, as we know, arises when the distribution of these resources from laws, policy, governance, and society um, means that one group is advantaged over the other. We frequently reference this in the literature or you'll hear about it on the news as social determinants of health. This lack of equitable opportunity gives rise to the disparities that we see in health status and health outcomes between different areas of our country. Now in New Mexico, some specific examples of our health disparities, as we all live and know, uh, we are number one in the nation for deaths by alcohol. Hispanic males in New Mexico have the highest rate of drug overdose. We also know during this pandemic and due with COVID-19 that racial and ethnic minorities experience disproportionate deaths. And it's directly related to what I've just depicted and outlined in this slide. Next slide. As it relates to our workforce, that is all of us here who are supervisors, who are providing behavioral health services, who are working perhaps as peer supports, as well as administrators um, administering these programs, we're looking at our population and workforce. So in New Mexico, we have a population of about 2 million. Our poverty rate, this is pre-COVID, was about 20%. And two brief demographics pulled from the latest census figures, 37% of our population identified as white and almost 50% as Hispanic Latino. And in New Mexico, 35% of our population speaks a language other than English at home. We have many languages, not just Spanish, but given the, that we're in a majority minority state, Hispanic Latino, we can presume that um, most of that 35% is going to be predominantly Spanish. Why? Well, because 37 million Latinos in the United States speak Spanish at home. 
In terms of workforce data from the New Mexico Legislative Workforce Report of 2019, 50% of the behavioral health providers who were non-independently licensed identified as Hispanic. So those are folks that are um, working perhaps toward licensure or working under clinical supervision. While 23% of independently licensed behavioral health providers identified Hispanic, as Hispanic. Um, now we know that not all Hispanic Latinos speak Spanish. However, what we do know from the Pew Hispanic Research, 58% of Hispanics say they've experienced discrimination or have been treated unfairly because of their race or ethnicity, at least from time to time. In contrast, about 70% of whites say they've never experienced this. So Spanish is a second world language spoken. First, of course, is Chinese. And there are worldwide 460 million Spanish speakers. The largest number of Spanish speakers are found in Mexico, Colombia, and the United States. New Mexico is the only state with two official languages. If you did any kind of absentee voter um, voting recently on your ballot, you would have seen that. So we are back to the importance then when it comes to behavioral health of emphasizing bilingualism and bilingual clinical supervision is crucial. Next slide. In this slide, I present to you um, a complex framework and model. I believe it was last week that our presenters in the interdisciplinary supervision workshop talked about behavioral health equity and proficiency. Behavioral health equity means that one has a right to access quality health care for all populations, regardless of their race, ethnicity, gender, SES, sexual orientation, or geographic location. This includes behavioral health care. And by treatment, we're referring to prevention, treatment, and recovery services for mental and substance use disorders. So this model that you see here, you have a handout from the National Center for Cultural Competence at Georgetown University. It's a cultural competence continuum. They have done amazing work to modify Cross's original model of 1989. And what this model shows is a framework from six stages from cultural destructiveness on the left all the way to cultural proficiency on the right. It is a gauge of allowing organizations as well as individuals to kind of gauge where you might be or where your agency might be or if you work for a state or university where that organization is. It is a process. It's not a how to become, right, how to become culturally competent, culturally proficient. It talks about a process of gauging where you are at as an organization or even individually in order to then develop goals and grow from there. So as an example, on the left side, you have uh, cultural destructiveness. So if your agency only provides um, behavioral health services for the privileged and dominant groups, they or perhaps at a cultural destructiveness stage because they are um, not at a cultural competent or proficient stage. So on the other end, they are not necessarily implementing changes to improve services based upon cultural needs. Another way to think about this is because I'm a bilingual clinical psychologist, if I, psychologist, if I'm gauging sort of where I'm at, maybe I consider myself culturally competent and proficient in working with the uh, Latinx Hispanic population, but if I am operating from maintaining stereotypes and um, work in an agency with unfair hiring practices for Black and African American populations, I could be culturally incapable in that incapacity stage of serving another population. So it's really, really important to take a look at this. And I share this with you, and I, I I, I want to quote some um, researchers out of Stanford who really highlighted racialized experiences, however you identify culturally and however your community and those that you serve identify, racialized experiences shape how we think, how people think, develop, and behave, and we must include it in the healthcare treatment. It is ethically irresponsible if we do not. 
From this perspective also, we also want to include strengths based and resiliency perspective, as well as understand the impact of discrimination, inequality, and inequity related to racism. Next slide. Ooh. Um, okay, this is, um, it looks like this was a, an older version. So, um, that's okay. This is inclusivity in class. You will have a little bit uh, different slide on your um, handout. So the class standards, CLAS, are culturally and linguistically appropriate services. Class standards were developed by the Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health back in 2000. They enhance them or revise them. That's okay, Sylvia, no worries. Leave it up. No worries. They enhanced them or revised them in 2013 to expand the cultural definition of what culture is as well as um, the definition of health. You also have a separate handout um, specifically on the class standards that go into more detail, so, so don't worry about um, jotting all of this down if you seem to be taking some notes. But what these are, are standards to um, enhance the services that are provided, specifically health equity and improve the quality of services and help eliminate those disparities that I talked about initially. Um, the principal standard one um, calls on organizations to provide effective, equitable, understandable, and respectful quality care and services that are responsive to diverse cultural health beliefs and practices preferred languages, health literacy, and other communication needs. So if you think about that framework I just provided, I'm really operating on the right side, right? The cultural competence and cultural responsivity um, side of that framework. But here our federal government is telling us, and if you work in an agency, a university, or institution that gets any kind of federal government grants, in particular from SAMHSA, SAMHSA expects recipients to implement what is called the class standards. I've only described the um, one principle, but the class standards give organizations action steps for implement, implementing culturally and linguistically appropriate services. They're divided into three areas. So the first area talks about governance, leadership, and workforce. So things like recruitment and promotion. So if you work in agencies where they where your job description or when you were hired, they preferred bilingual clinicians or to provide bilingual services to the community. The second area relates to the communication and language assistance. So specifically talking about language assistance must be provided in agencies that receive federal monies at no cost for those members that receive those services who are considered limited English proficient. And that agency must ensure the competence of providing uh, of those individuals or interpreters providing those services. So if you are that clinician, that bilingual clinician, and you're providing those services, what the class standards say is those agencies and universities must ensure that you're competent to provide those services. And they must ensure that those interpreters are competent. And finally, the third area talks about um, continuous improvement, so quality assurance and continuous improvement. And these class standards can be applied to a wide array of professions and sectors. Next slide. They are also available in Spanish, and you had the link there. Uh, Okay, so I had two slides, um, Sylvia, on effective supervisor skills and techniques, and um, that's okay, and ineffective. Don't worry about pulling them up. They have access to them on the slides. I'm just going to briefly tell you that um, there are two slides. So the first slide here that you have access to, if you've downloaded it from the chat box, 
effective be supervisor skills, techniques, and behaviors, and ineffective. So given our frameworks, and no doubt your commitment to providing culturally and linguistically responsive and proficient behavioral health services, as well as supervision. So if you're a clinician, if you're a supervisor, if you're an administrator, or other, other individual in the agency, what we know about effective supervisory skills, so things that we want to do more of, um, I'm just going to highlight two out of the entire list that are there on the slide set. The first is a strengthened supervisory relationship, and the, section, the second is demonstration of knowledge and clinical skills. So the supervisory relationship empowering the supervisee and the supervisor's um, own expert skills, especially serving the Hispanic and Latinx populations in the community and state of New Mexico. So the supervisor is working to empower and have a very strong supervisory relationship. That is a good thing. We want more of that. We also want more supervisors to understand, especially if your agency um, is serving, and if it's not serving, um, as you saw from the statistics I presented, they need to serve um, our community and our community's needs. Um, the supervisor needs to demonstrate having, those no having knowledge of the populations being served, especially in New Mexico, related to the historical information, related to the migration history, related to legal status or not of individuals being served. A particular example would be, let's say you're supervising um, a clinician and a, the clinician's client is a DACA recipient. A DACA recipient is a Deferred Action Childhood Arrival recipient. That supervisor needs to know what DACA is, what that means. They need to have knowledge of the history, knowledge of the impact of legislation, knowledge of the current threats to that individual, knowledge of that person's pre-migration history, their post-migration history, all of these kinds of things because they're supervising that clinician who's working with that DACA recipient. It's very similar to you would not expect that DACA recipient, the client, to teach the clinician providing them services everything they need to know about DACA. The reason why, it can be very re-traumatizing and it's not an example of being culturally competent or culturally responsive. And so the same is true with not expecting the clinician who knows that and is providing those services to teach the supervisor. Now, we haven't even discussed the language skills. So let's say that that clinician is working with the client in Spanish. If that supervisor does not have those clinical skills of being able to supervise and speak and understand Spanish ethically and responsibly, they're, they're, they're performing unethical work. Okay, because they are not meeting um, these effective supervisory skills and behaviors. And my colleagues are going to talk a little bit more about this. The second slide here, next slide, is the ineffective supervisor skills, techniques, and behaviors. So things that we don't want to do, things that we want to avoid doing, right? Um, I already mentioned if your supervisor is not knowledgeable about the various Hispanic and Latinx cultures that you are um, working with, um, that's not a good thing. That supervisor is demonstrating inefficient knowledge as well as language skills that I have already mentioned. The lack of misapplication of, of, of theory would be, for example, most of our psychological and counseling theories, it is changing, but the way that we have been trained, if you have been trained in this country, went to school in this country, you are applying theories and knowledge to communities and populations that are receiving health care and behavioral health care services that are not included in all of that research and assuming that it's applicable. Again, my colleagues are going to discuss more of those in detail. I thank you very much and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Silvia Costa. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here, thank you to the symposium organizers and, and to Marie for including me in this presentation. 
And also thank you for your lovely introduction. Um, I, I'll just say a little bit more about myself. Um, I work at the Center for Development and Disability, which is a uh, part of the Department of Pediatrics at UNM. Um, as you mentioned, I specialize in the assessment and treatment of autism spectrum disorders in young children, and I specialize in serving um, monolingual and bilingual English and Spanish speaking families. Um, and so for the past couple years uh, in my role, I've uh, directed the psychology training that we provide at the Center for Development and Disability. And so part of that is um, we do have a formal postdoctoral psychology fellowship training program in two tracks. And one is the autism spectrum disorder track and the other is the uh, early childhood track. And then we also host uh, two internship tracks, the same um, autism and early childhood um, for folks who are training in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences tracks um, at, at UNM. So we host um, interns coming in to, to train with us in, in our clinics. Um, and so since I've been supervising for the past couple years, um, you know, realizing that I needed um, help and support in my own um, uh, services in terms of um, supervising and training bilingual um, trainees. Um, you know, I've been a provider for, for a long time and I, as a provider, I worked in building my own skills um, in providing services, but then I realized, wait a second, this bilingual supervision piece is a little different. Um, it's it's a, a unique area and so I need to develop my own skills in that area as well. So part of my participation in, in this talk has been learning as well um, because I, I don't say that, that I am an expert in this area at all um, because I'm, I'm sort of learning as I'm going and I'm, I learned, a, you know, I'm learning as I'm going as a provider as well and I think that, that that I share that because that that's often the experience of um, of us as providers. Um, you know, we learn as we go. Um, we we have to pick and choose the different experiences and and um, practicums and and supervisors that that, that we can get. Um, and that's been part of my my training um, and my experience as well. And that's, and that's why I talk about that because, um, as Karen will, will talk about later, you know, this is the experience of, of bilingual providers, um, but also, um, bilingual trainees. Um, and so obviously I was a trainee myself and, and had to go through this process. Um, and, you know, and I think in, in the work that we do, we're always evolving. And so part of part of my participation in this was also to learn. And, and I know that there are tons of experienced providers out there um, as well. And so, you know, we, we definitely want to be able at the end to, to share the, that expertise. Um, so I think Marie did a nice job of outlining, you know, what, what are the needs? And we know that there are, increases in bilingual clients um, and you know obviously we're focusing on Spanish um, English and Spanish today but we know that the other languages are also important um, so in in New Mexico for the behavioral health concerns there's more and more clients that are needing these services um, including children including young children and and because that's the area that I've focused on um, that's where where I'll talk about today um, so an increased need for then bilingual behavioral health providers and because we're doing all of this work then there's an increased need for bilingual supervision for behavioral health providers right so it's just it's just an ongoing cycle um, and um, what I want to talk about is, is a little bit about, you know, this idea of cultural competency, um, but also cultural and linguistic competencies. Um, so in 2017, APA came up with these guidelines really to, with the idea that we need to address the changes in the population um, that psychologists work with and, and address the intersection of identities, um, ethnicity, race, age, 
uh, ability, sexual orientation, all those areas, and 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 really provide services that are uh, multiculturally competent. And so these guidelines um, particularly are relevant in what we're talking about today, specifically guideline number three, which really states that we understand the role of language and communication and how psychologists um, use their own language and um, use that intersection. Sorry guys, I'm parenting. Um, working from home and parenting. So that's that's what happens. Alexa start the Alexa timer goes off. <laughs> so um, we do know this because communication can be, you know, compromised, especially in the clinical setting. Um, so you know, a lot of things that can be lost in translation and we want to be able to, to reduce those barriers. And this is why we provide um, bilingual services and bilingual um, um, assessment and intervention. And we know that there is an impact on non-English speakers when we are in these medical environments. And so this guideline I thought was really important to bring out. Um, and the reason is that language is culture. Um, we cannot separate those out. Um, it, it really, language really does impact um, what our culture, um, it, it's the core. Um, when we talk about the role of language, um, providing services, it really is important that, that, that behavioral health providers are responsive to this idea. Um, you know, thinking about how language is so tied um, to, especially in New Mexico. Um, you know, I grew up in southern New Mexico and the, our Spanish is, is quite different. It's more border Spanish um, than the, uh, some of the, the Spanish in northern New Mexico. And knowing those nuances and how those are really related to where we come from in, in just just thinking about you know central and northern New Mexico and southern New Mexico and how things might be said differently. Like when I moved here, um, you know I I didn't know what I I used the word luminarias for the farolitos. I was like, what is this? This is a luminaria, not a farolito. Um, and so you know that that's that tells us about who we are, our culture, where we come from. It's such a strong and important factor in in culture. Um, and, and when it comes to behavioral health, it's extremely important. Um, just thinking about, especially like, like you were talking about, Marie, the stigma related to behavioral health and how that is so much stronger um, sometimes in, in, in Spanish. You know, when you talk about, you know, está loco, right? That's, that's he's crazy. Um, that really has a strong connotation um, in Spanish and it really does relate to some of the stigma that's related and so um, there's just so much and we can you know we could go on and on about language and the importance of language and culture um, but the other piece is really um, you know in order to provide cultural and linguistic competent services that first step is really looking at your own um, your own language your own culture and so understanding your own bilingualism if you are bilingual um, I think uh, Marie you mentioned you were a heritage um, speaker and um, and so I have these definitions um, on here to just give you um, that the idea of what these mean so a native speaker um, is someone who is going to have that home and academic languages in the same um, the same thing. So your academic language, um, which is your education, your reading, your writing, where do, you know what you learned. Um, the native speaker is going. To, it's it's going to be the same language. Um, so I'm I'm a native speaker. My home language early on was Spanish, and then I didn't you know get that much exposure until until school. Um, and so I consider myself a, a native speaker and then a heritage speaker is someone who may have their home language um, is one and then that's different from the academic language that they were educated in. Um, so I think this comes up for our um, poll. I just wanted to see who's out there in terms of um, how you identify.
Okay, so and I'm I'm, ass, I'm assuming these are bilingual providers, and um, so we've got about sixty three percent native speakers and thirty seven percent heritage speakers. So that's good. Um, all right. And then the other thing that I wanted to just talk about in terms of these specific definitions um, is that, you know, we, we know about language development and how language develops um, in young children, but then there's also this piece around bilingual language development um, and how does that happen? And so um, when we think about, when we think about it this way, um, there's two kind of processes going on in terms of bilingual language development, so dual language or, or even more than one language. Um, and this can also be important as, as we learn about ourselves and about um, our clients that we work with. What is that exposure like? What is that bilingual language exposure? Um, so we talk about sequential. Um, so this is when you hear two languages pretty much at the same time. Um, and so, and we, the age is kind of different in different um, literature, depending on where you look, but three is right around the age. Um, so I kind of consider myself a sequential learner because I was, um, you know, my home language was Spanish. My parents spoke mostly Spanish. Um, I was raised around my father's um, grand, uh, parents who were monolingual Spanish speakers. And my parents did know some English and, and they interacted with each other in English. So I did have that exposure before age three. So I did have some, then it wasn't until school that then I became educated in English. So, you know, that's where a, a sequential language learner might look. Um, and then the other area is the simultaneous where you learn two languages after you're already well established in the first language. So for um, our clients, this could be one or the other, right? And so, um, um, and then also when you're thinking about the simultaneous, a lot of um, our young children, especially and the children I tend to see in our clinics, like the three and four year olds, um, their primary language is still Spanish. Um, they're not, you know, they're maybe receiving some preschool services in English, but really their, their home language is still Spanish. And so they're still um, those native speakers and they're not exposed in, until, until school. Um, and so this is really important. We're thinking about particularly assessment, um, which is the work that I do, and I don't do as much intervention, but this process is really important when you're thinking about, well, how, what, is, what is their core language in terms of their emotional language? And how do they, how do they interact with other, the social language, um, but also how do they access their emotions. Um, and, you know, a lot of us who are bilingual, you know, will we'll do that translating in your head. And so do you think in Spanish? And um, then you have to, then it comes out in English, or do you think in English and it has to come out in Spanish? And, and it's different for everybody. And um, it's just really important to think about this process as, as, we, as we do the work with our clients. Um, and so here's that next poll just to see, um, so you can kind of apply this for yourself. All right, so we've got about half of our monolingual um, English providers. And then um, looks like most of the bilingual folks um, are simultaneous learners. And then we've got some sequential learners as well. Okay, so that's, that's interesting. Um, and then, yeah, so does anybody have any questions around those or anybody who wants to kind of share their language exposure experience? I'm open to that. Just a question. This is Sandra. Um, 
about monolingual and simultaneous. I grew up uh, monolingual Spanish in Mexico until age 12. So that would be considered simultaneous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, so your, your second language is English. Um, and so your home one is, is Spanish and then you acquired that second language. Um, yeah, and, and that's a really good point because, um, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about our supervisees, um, me especially, right? So um, that, that native language is really important to think about um, when you're doing that work. And sometimes the English as a second language um, is something to consider um, as well. So yeah, thank you for that. This is Socorro. I wanted to also share that I, was a monolingual until age 20, I don't know. I was pretty pretty older when I started going into school and transitioning into my English, which at the same, which as, I, as of now, I'm still having difficulties expressing myself in, in writing and vocally, not because I don't know the language, but it's kind of like my brain is still transitioning if I didn't do it when I was young, I'm still having a hard time as a as an older person. So although I feel myself, I I'm simultaneously bilingual. Um, I still have difficulties just on the outcome. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But I feel myself very bilingual. Mhm, mm mhm. Yeah, and then there's all the um, the levels of proficiency, right? And so it looks like I'm reading the chats. You know, and you could be proficient in speaking, but not in writing, or you can be proficient in reading, but not in speaking. And so that's a whole different level of, of you know, that proficiency and how comfortable you feel. Um, you know, I, I, I can speak and I can do assessments and I can, um, you know, do therapy, but I, don't ask me to write my report in Spanish. Like there's no way that I can do that, right? And so either way, right, either way. And so thinking about, um, you know, the native Spanish speakers who didn't necessarily get schooling um, in English, but then come to this country and are expected to write reports and write um, in English and write fluently. That's something to think about in, in supervision and when working with bilingual providers. So it goes both ways. Absolutely. I, I, I grew up in, in uh, Mexico, just only speaking oh, hey, Spanish. Hey, hey. and then um, I got chipped off to Michigan. Um, to get immersed into speaking English um, during my high school years. And so that, that, that's when I ended up learning English as a second language. And, um, and now when I ever go back and visit my family in Mexico, I feel like I really don't know where I belong because quite a bit of my life I spent it um, here. When I go back to Mexico, my Spanish is weird. My English is weird. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. It's, it's interesting to try to figure out um, how, how do we feel in terms of language and culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, and, and as I've developed also, it's, you know, my technical Spanish has definitely gotten much better. Um, and so sometimes my family's like, what are you saying? Like that, that's the too technical of a word. Don't say that word. <laughs> it's always very fascinating to me to have these conversations um, because, it, you know, it's so, um, it, it's so nice to hear people's diff different experiences um, around this. Um, and, and something, you know, that I enjoy doing in supervision as well is talking about this piece. And so, um, and that's, and that's where the, you know, it, it's a complex issue um, to really understand this. And, and so that's where I encourage, um, you know, as a, as a supervisor to really have this conversation 
with your um, trainees right from the very beginning, um, you know, to talk about their language development, their, their language history, and how does that impact um, their, their work that they do, right? Um, how does that impact how they interact with their clients? Um, code switching in, in therapy and in supervision is, is recommended and, and, and such a good way to build a rapport um, both in in supervision and in therapy um, because it really does help with that interaction and in code switching means um, switching it you know it has a couple different meanings but in this context i'm talking about code switching between um, english and spanish when you're talking in the same sentence um, and so you know encouraging that and doing that in supervision um, and then the, you know the other piece that that i talk about here is um, is what we talk about in terms of education um, and what is coming up as the best practices. And so, again, this is the area where I'm learning and I'm trying to figure out for myself as well. Um, but the nice thing is that there's more and more literature about this and this is a really, what's been um, eye-opening for me in that in the last 10 years, right, from, from from when I was a trainee, this didn't exist. Um, and so there's more and more literature. And a few of the, um, the recommendations made by those researching and teaching and training of bilingual mental health professionals um, is really the idea of formalizing the trainings for practitioners. Um, so there are some model programs out there that are including things like professional, uh, you know, professional technical Spanish courses, uh, thinking about uh, courses in Latinx psychology, um, Chicano studies, um, those kinds of courses that are very specific to learning about the population that you're working with, um, how to do bilingual assessments, um, and then thinking about opportunities for professional de uh, language development, so doing this in informal versus formal ways. Um, so when I was a po postdoc, we had a a practice group um, for those of us who, who were providing services in Spanish. And so we would get together both formally and informally to go uh, to talk about the different um, aspects of the work that we were doing, whether it was like, well, how do you say this word in Spanish? Or how do you get your clients to, you know, disclose in, around this area versus just kind of getting together and practicing our Spanish and in informal ways. So um, DSM-5 training in Spanish like um, Marie does. And so really um, doing this in, in both formal and informal ways. And then experience. So, you know, you can't have all this coursework and not really see clients. Um, so that's the other piece. But then the supervised experience. And some of the, um, um, one of the things, and, and Marie, you mentioned this, but in, uh, you know, if, if the service is in Spanish, then, you know, I think the best practice is that supervision should occur in Spanish as well um, or in, in, in another language. And, and that's not always possible. And we get that. And we get that here in New Mexico, um, you know, given the numbers that you that you talked about, you know, that's not always possible, but that I think we're striving towards that as the best practice. Um, so really thinking about that. And, and if that can happen, then what, what can you do, right? Where, where can you get some consultation or where can you provide some support for either yourself as a supervisor or the trainee? Um, so I'm just briefly going to talk about the clinic um, that, that I do, and this by no means is the, is, is the ideal way to do it. This is sort of what I've been developing in my own sense, um, and, and just to give you an example of, of what we're doing to train um, psychology interns and postdocs, and this is in my very specific track. Um, but what we do is um, autism um, diagnostic assessments. And so in this um, space, um, we do train the bilingual supervisees um, and provide a formalized training experience um, in this way. Um, so I do provide um, live supervision using a developmentally appropriate or developmental approach, which means um, thinking about the language proficiency of this supervisee. So we do not require, um, if 
if somebody wants to participate in this clinic that they are proficient in Spanish, but if they're interested and when we work with them there. So I've ranged in terms of my supervisees from a, a native speaker whose Spanish was way better than mine um, to somebody who was just kind of starting to learn Spanish and apply those skills in, in an assessment um, situation. So I've had kind of that range. Um, and then in terms of the live supervision, you know, supporting the trainee in as much as they need. So if they've never conducted a, a clinical interview in completely in Spanish, I'm there to support them and, you know, live with the, with the patient, um, supporting them to do that all the way through the, the process of providing the feedback at the end. And then that's um, on top of individual one-on-one -on -one supervision. Um, and I'm getting better at doing that in Spanish as well. That's another skill to learn. Um, and I, I realized that, that I needed to learn that as well. Um, and then using a, a culturally and linguistically um, competent uh, assessment. So um, in this aspect, we have a bilingual team and that consists of myself as the bilingual psychologist. I am very privileged to work with a bilingual speech and language pathologist and then whichever other um, team members in terms of the trainee, we also have some um, wonderful social workers that work with us as well and um, had, had more recently hired a bilingual social worker to work with us um, on our team's you know pre and post evaluation so um, all of the history taking um, that we do includes some language exposure um, history taking so asking specifically about the parent and the child's language exposure um, you know whether that includes the home language and, and any kind of additional schooling to who they speak with um, in terms of uh, grandparents, peers, siblings, um, and taking a really good history there. Uh, and then using a good battery to look at um, uh, cognitive uh, language and then obviously the autism pieces and the other behavioral health pieces, but we usually utilize a nonverbal cognitive assessment, and then we do language proficiency testing. So that was what I was talking about earlier. So um, looking at their, their ability to use language in a social way, both in English and in Spanish, if that has um, not already been done, sometimes that has been done. And then we use any of those translated uh, measures um, that are available to us. Um, so, you know, there, there are always barriers um, to, to the work that we do, and um, these are kind of the ones that, that I've kind of run across, um, long wait lists, obviously. Um, when I started providing this service, we didn't really have um, a wait list, and then that just kind of grew um, really quickly. Um, you know, and, and barriers to um, accessing those services are already there. And then we have this um, um, on top of that. So, uh, you know, bilingual providers often have really full caseloads and they can get really full really quickly. Um, and so um, other things that come up, um, you know, needing to request uh, forms and materials in Spanish, you know, having to buy all the materials if they are already there or having to, to get those um, forms translated um, and things like things, uh, you know, some implicit biases that are related to some of, to, to being able to provide um, bilingual services like oh there's you know there's no funding for translation and interpretation and as Marie noted you know that that's that's illegal we can't do that um, but other implicit biases that come up and, and this is where I encourage folks who are um, providing the services to think about those um, you know well it's, it's really too hard to use an interpreter or it takes like two times it takes way longer ten times longer to use an interpreter um, and so, you know, that, that really is taking up too much time or I'd rather, you know, I'd rather not, um, you know, have to deal with trying to find the interpreter and then calling them and then they're, they're busy, you know, there, there's lots of things that come up in terms of biases um, and that, that can become barriers to establishing um, these bilingual services. So, 
Um, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll just end there unless there are any um, particular questions, but I think, um, you know, we can also um, talk about those in our, in our breakout groups when we go there, so. So, so thank you so much, Dr. Acosta. So we're now going to have Karen present and we're likely not going to do the breakouts, um, but we will have some time at the end for um, an overall um, question and answer with the larger group. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, so I'm going to do a brief introduction before transitioning into my presentation. I want to start off by saying that I can definitely feel it's lunchtime. Um, we're almost there. Um, but once again, uh, my name is Karen Elizabeth Godinez Gonzalez. Um, a little bit about me so you can kind of get a, an idea of, you know, who I am, where I come from, and how that, that informs our research today and my clinical work. Um, is I was raised both in Mexico and California. At the age of four, my family decided to immigrate to Santa Ana, California, which is where I was raised after four. Um, and so I was, I lived in California until I was the age of 22. I graduated from the University of California, Irvine in sociology and psychology. Um, and then here I go to Wisconsin to pursue my master's in counseling psych. It was definitely a huge culture shock, not just the weather, um, the campus, it was the people, it was just everything. Um, so that definitely informs a lot of my work and it informed a lot of my work in Wisconsin. I predominantly worked um, with Latinos who were undocumented and monolingual in Spanish. I had no bilingual training as um, Dr. Acosta mentioned. And it was difficult to provide the services to su such a vulnerable community with little, with no training actually, um, and no bilingual supervision. So I think that definitely informed um, not just my clinical work and supervision experience, but then also my decision to pursue um, a PhD in counseling psychology at the university, well, New Mexico State University. Um, I'm actually now receiving official bilingual training and supervision and I'm getting my minor in professional Spanish counseling and a minor in primary care. Um, so it's, it's been wonderful to be here in the Southwest. I've provided therapy to both um, Wisconsin and New Mexico, but then also Texas. Um, and one of my practicums at the University of Texas El Paso. And that's where I also received bilingual training and supervision. So it's been amazing, not given that not a lot of people get to experience that. Um, and so today as a third year counseling psychology student. I'm a PhD candidate as of two weeks ago. Um, and a few days ago, I proposed my dissertation, which was successful. Thank you for celebrating with me. Um, and now this weekend, I'll be submitting eight applications for internships. So that's all of my life right now. Um, but I'm glad to be here with you all and would like to share with you specifically more about supervisees and bilingual trainees' experiences. Oh, could you? Yes, thank you. I was like clicking, I'm like, it's not going. What's well, on my desktop? <laughs> um, so I'll start by talking about, well, kind of just, you know, mention, you know, Dr. Weil and then Dr. Acosta have already mentioned the importance. Thank you, thank you. Um, the importance of bilingual training and bilingual supervision. Um, and so we know that that's important. And I think it's also important for us to know a little bit more about the unique barriers that I myself as a trainee and supervisee and other bilingual trainees and supervisees face. To begin, we will highlight again that there is a lack of bilingual training in general. If you don't attend a program that specializes in professional Spanish counseling or offers that type of training, you will most likely never get it. Even after going through your master's, your PhD, and you start practicing, you will start practicing as a licensed psychologist without um, professional training and supervision sometimes, unfortunately. So, how does that affect our experience with the supervisees? Well, we experience higher rates of burnout. Um, and a lot of the times it's because we have limited support, limited resources. We feel isolated because perhaps um, our peers or colleagues are not experiencing a lot of these things. Um, and so in addition to feeling isolated, we experience the, burning, the burden of having to translate videos. So for example, whenever I have to transcribe some sort of clip. I don't just transcribe it in Spanish, I have to transcribe it in English, unless I have an English speaking client. Um, and it's very difficult. Um, 
and there's also, uh, you know, the, the burden of having to translate videos for supervision specifically. If your supervisor is not bilingual and here you have a very important session that maybe you want to consult about, you perhaps have to either translate on the spot or translate it prior to attending supervision. And these are the typ different, different type of tasks that I would say that definitely contribute to our burnout, higher rates of burnout. We also are language brokers. We have additional responsibilities like having to translate forms. We want to provide psychoeducation, but we cannot find this information online. What are we going to do? Sit down for an hour, translate, and then have those materials ready for our clients. I had to do a lot of that in Wisconsin. Um, I had to get very creative. And so there's also the burden of having to complete other type of forms. Um, I've worked with clients that needed my support in translating a ticket or some sort of like DMV uh, bill or some sort of like court order and all of these different type of things um, come with our job as a therapist. And I love doing it. And I also have to acknowledge that um, although there's a lot of pride in being able to um, serve our community, there's a lot of challenges that we experience. In addition, we experience higher caseloads of monolingual Spanish speaking clients. When I was an intern in, in Madison, Wisconsin, um, I completed about 300 direct hours and I had one client um, that was white and monolingual English. So the rest of my direct hours were all in Spanish with no training on our bilingual supervision. How do we do it? We just do it. Um, and we have to acknowledge that although it's done, we can always you know, do more to support bilingual trainings and supervisees. And my literature review is available to you all. So if y'all want to know more about bilingual trainees and supervisees, we can definitely, I could definitely share those references for you all. And then Dr. Eccles said you can transition. Um, and given that this presentation is specifically on supervision, I believe it's important for me to emphasize that there is no bilingual supervisory framework or model. So there's no model showing supervisor how to best work with bilingual supervisees and trainees. And so I feel like that definitely adds to why we experience such unique barriers and challenges. Um, currently, there is a model um, that looks at Latina Latina diet supervisory relationship, um, and it integrates Latinx multicultural counseling competencies, and it looks at Latinx ethnic identity theory, um, specifically in the context of supervision. And there's a lot of discussion about culture and the importance of culture and supervision. And there's a very little section on language and bilingualism. Um, and it discusses the importance of, as a supervisor, being able to assess your supervisees, um, well, language competencies and like how comfortable they are with Spanish or being bilingual. So that can kind of better inform your work with them and, and see if you need to provide them with extra support. Um, but this is the context in the context of Latina Latina supervisory diets, and that's not always the case, right? Because there's a lack of bilingual trainees, there's a lack of bilingual um, clinicians in general, so there's a lack of bilingual supervisors. And so it's just, it tears up, right? Um, so what do we do, you know? Like, how, how do we best work with bilingual supervisees? We can skip to the next one. Um, so there are best practices, as Dr. Acosta and Dr. Weil mentioned, you know, we should, as Spanish English bilingual counselors, we should be receiving um, training specialized in Spanish and supervision specialized in Spanish. However, we also know that that's not the reality and we have to work with what we got. Um, but also, I'd like to highlight the importance of advocacy, right? If you, and not just like if you're an English monolingual supervisor, but if you're a supervisor in general, if you really want to support bilingual trainees and supervisees, um, you really need to advocate for the increase of cultural Spanish language prof proficiency um, in terms of, you know, like helping them either advance um, in training and get that particular training. Um, and then, you know, that comes with advocating for funds, um, advocating for like extra time and, and um, a lot more other things that kind of go with that. And it's important for you to advocate to employ bilingual supervisors and counselors. So it's like knowing your limits, right? You don't know how to work with bilingual supervisees. Advocating for a bilingual supervisor that may understand a little bit more, you know, the importance of language, the role of language within supervision and how to provide that support. Um, and, you know, if we're talking about systems, 
we're not just talking about agency, you know, actually encouraging counseling licensure boards to include cultural diversity language training as a required continuum education unit. Um, and Delgado Romero's and colleagues um, article from 2018, they mentioned how a lot of the times bilingual training is not even an option because as trainees, we already have a curriculum and courses and expectations and competencies that we have to um, fulfill. So where is there even room for bilingual training? Um, you know, like for me, for example, for my bilingual training here at NMSU, um, my minor in Spanish, professional Spanish counseling, I was able to waive five courses of my master's program. And so now three of those courses were replaced with my Spanish minor. And so that's extra time, that's extra money, that's that's just an, an investment that not a lot of students have to do because they're not bilingual trainees or supervisees and don't offer services to this um, vulnerable community, which is a Spanish um, or Spanish English bilingual Latinx community. And could you skip to the next? So, given that I just proposed on Monday, um, I'm specifically looking at culture, humility, and supervision. And so we know that there is no supervisory framework that you know, informs you how to best support bilingual supervisees. But given my experience as a supervisee, I believe that when I have, when I had white English monolingual supervisors, when they invited me to bring my culture, to bring my experiences with language into supervision, when they practice cultural humility, that helped me not just develop as a professional, but then also make, it helped me feel confident. Um, that I can trust my experiences, that I can trust my background, and there was still room to grow and to learn more about um, the community that we're serving. For example, for me, I didn't know what Chiple was. And Chiple is like, you know, such a, it's like a, re a regional phrase for consentida or chiqueada is how I know it in California or in Mexico where we're from. Um, but, you know, like being able, so if, if my clients feel safe, and they trust me enough to bring these type of like words and explain to them because I'm like curiously like I'm genuinely curious to know more about the word then I want to have those processes and supervision as well so as a supervisor it would be important to practice cultural humility not just to foster the working alliance but then also to help us flourish as linguistic and culturally responsive clinicians so um, I'll leave you all um, with that Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, very valuable contributions in terms of that. So there were two slides I believe that we have left and I'm gonna offer my colleagues to, to state um, something briefly about this and then we're gonna open it up for some question and answers. You have several um, slides, or excuse me, several handouts that resource interpreter guidelines, especially providing interpretation remote if you work with interpreters, the class standards, working with a foreign language interpreter, the cultural competence continuum, and then a resource that um, I did put together, it's like a two, two page resource. Um, and in addition to several um, citations and articles, there is a place where it talks about um, Spanish counseling skill development. There are a couple of programs um, online that are um, not accredited, but you, you can get CEs. It's called um, Spanish for Counselors. That's one of the online programs. Of course, lots, of, lots more immersion programs are available whereby um, they have programs specifically for mental health professionals where you might be traveling, for example, to a community in Mexico and um, meeting with um, mental health providers and practicing your skills. I don't know about some of the universities that offer like those continuous continuing education programs that were offered with um, Our Lady of the Lake University before, but several are listed there. Um, in addition, you know, on the job, so many agencies reimburse for folks to go to trainings, and if you're a bilingual clinician and um, supervisor, you know, advocating for your agency to certainly reimburse that. If you have been hired or um, if you're in a position of writing job descriptions and working with HR to hire bilingual managers, bilingual clinicians, bilingual peer supports, and you have vetted in terms of evaluating their competency to provide 
the, the treatment in, in Spanish and they're providing that treatment, they need to be reimbursed for that. The Spanish clinical skills is a skill that needs to be reimbursed. It's not a free, it's not free, just like um, if you have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a license, it's not free. You're being paid and your skills need to be paid for as well. It's what we've done with the field of interpretation it is validated that um, being an interpreter or being a translator, um, a, a professional person has those skills and should be um, reimbursed for that. Do my colleagues have additional things that they want to talk about in terms of the Spanish skills development? And, you know, one of the things is just because you grow up speaking Spanish or speaking another language does not necessarily translate over to the clinical work, um, which is why we're emphasizing this whole program today. This is so, Sandra. Have, yeah. have, sorry. Um, have you considered collaborations with uh, institutions that would provide a more organic um, training as far as the technical terms? Uh, and I, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, foreign institutions, like establishing collaborations like uh, some departments do for study abroad, those types of, but now for training um, professionals. So you're saying like um, to consider that for New Mexico, that is a wonderful idea. And, you know, that is part of, I, I believe, what we hope as far as next steps. Jen, I hope you're writing that down. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Sandra, for, for verbalizing that. Um, you're saying that that would be important and that's, that's possible, right? Yeah, I'm saying that it would be probably a more organic and coming from professionals in the field to teach you what it looks like, you know, for example, in Mexico, what it looks like. I have a cuñada, a sister-in-law that's a psychologist. I'm a social worker, a clinically licensed social worker, and she's a psychologist, bachelor's level. And I can tell you that the competency of a psychologist in Mexico exceeds what we would expect probably in the institutions in the US. Absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. Having worked um, with, with professionals, um, that's one of the reasons why I don't serve children and adolescents because I worked with um, child adolescent um, therapists, master's level therapists that were professionally trained um, as such. And we could go on and on, you're absolutely right. Um, so that's an excellent point. Um, this slide here with regard to interpreters, just briefly, I'm going to reference your handouts. Um, I, I know some of you do work with interpreters. If you're a monolingual English um, clinician or supervisor and you bring in interpreters, those interpreters um, should be vetted. They, they, they should go through some sort of an evaluative process or with that company if they're working with them because they're not only serving uh, the interpreter role, they're serv serving a cultural broker role. And as the you know, monolingual supervisor or clinician, there are certain things that would be appropriate to make sure that happen meeting with that interpreter before the actual session, clarifying the roles, clarifying seating, having sort of a pre-meeting, and then also having a, a post-meeting where sometimes some of the cultural issues that are important um, could be further explained to the non, um, Spanish speaking clinician or supervisor definitely provide for additional time. And, you know, the thing about the um, interpretation and translation of, of forms and questionnaires and things like that, really working to advocate that our agencies are, are not um, overburdening their clinicians or overburdening their staff, and that's outside of their role, and they're also not getting paid for that. That's, that's valuable time, that's valuable skill, and we want to make sure it's accurate um, and reflects the, the needs of the population. So we want to open up for some questions, and then Jen also has some things that she has to share. Um, we're so New Mexico State has programs, um, Highlands has programs specifically in terms of bilingual bicultural programs as well. But can we open up for questions if you want to put them in the chat, if you want to be able to um, just open your mics?
really appreciate the conversations and the information being provided. Um, let's see, it was, I'm sorry, I missed the, the name, um, who it was. It's already escaped me, Brenda. So Brenda um, indicates that we do have a seal for individuals who graduate from high school who um, are bilingual. There's a high school seal and that's wonderful. Um, you know, part of what I did in preparation for this um, presentation before I was able to meet um, Karen and, and and Sylvia is, you know, I talked with colleagues across the country about some of the changes and I heard about California, again, where I was born and um, many other programs, some of the programs, training programs are getting some of these seals as well. But um, they reflected what the presenters have talked about today in terms of we haven't necessarily had these experiences or exposures and now that we are in agencies or in universities or in states, um, we need to be advocating for that. And even here in New Mexico, um, with regard to if you're working for the state and you're hired and you're bilingual, I mean, there should be some sort of differential for that, right? Karen and Sylvia, um, just kind of opening it up in terms of questions or final kinds of comments and things that you want to make folks aware of? Um, it looks like um, Mika has a question. Um, of the state licensing board that recognizes bilingual licensure, I, I don't know of any. Um, I in don't psychology at least. Yeah, I don't either. And just keep in mind that not all licensing boards, whether it's psychology, social work, or counseling, um, you know, even just requiring some sort of a cultural competency, continuing education, or cultural responsivity, right? I mean, that's kind of a, a relatively um, new thing, and it's not enough. I mean, we all probably can talk about we had one class in cultural diversity or cultural competency. Hello. <laughs> How is it that we have one class when the majority of the country um, is, is, is multicultural and diverse, right? <laughs> so Karen mentioned this advocacy. I mean, that's really kind of the, the intent. So if you are a bilingual clinician, a manager, a supervisor, and things are going super perfect at your agency and there's funding and resources, keep it up um, and, and keep up you know, that the, the agencies and the organizations continue to do really good work. Um, for those other agencies who are not, and um, you know, I, I've done a lot around my own county here and looking at that, we're not, we're not meeting the needs, right? We're not meeting the needs of a huge population and we need to be doing better with that. So, you know, being able to utilize some of the privileges that we may have if we're licensed clinicians or in agencies or organizations and helping to kind of move organizations along that continuum, but also um, why, why it's important, right? And, and being able to advocate for that, being able to advocate for um, the differential payments and reimbursement for, um, you know, the bilingual clinicians as well as the cultural skills. Marie, I think we're going to have to wrap it up on that note. Um, clearly, we could talk about this for quite some time. So I appreciate um, you and Sylvia and Karen sharing your expertise today.